okay, this is the last uh, track presentation, and we've got a good one for you with the folks from Oath, which is the combined company of Yahoo and AOL. Um, and we have with us today the Gemini product team, basically. So um, coming up first is going to be Kai. He's the senior, senior director of product management leading the Yahoo Gemini project. And then Jenny, who manages the engineering team for the uh, Gemini project. And then Haran, who's a software engineer on the team. So welcome up, Kai. Hey everybody, so my name is Kai and I'm the uh, product lead for Yahoo Gemini, which is Oath's uh, native and search ad network. Um, so there is a lot of stuff there. So first off, what is Oath? Um, so I come from the legacy Yahoo side. Verizon had acquired AOL and then last year they acquired Yahoo as well. And we have combined companies under the brand Oath, which is a house of brands, which I'll get into in a second. But basically, um, by bringing these two properties together, we are now a large media publishing and technology company at scale. Um, as you can see um, by some of the stats here, we have over 50 different brands, we have a ton of different apps and mobile websites, and most importantly, we touch over a billion users every single month. So, um, what is a search uh, and native advertising network? So, uh, this is um, Marissa Mayer's legacy. So when she showed up at Yahoo in 2013, she embarked on a huge redesign of all of our websites, all of our mobile apps, and all of our mobile websites. And her thesis was that banner ads are a suboptimal user experience. They're ugly, they, they're interstitials, they interrupt the experience, and users generally dislike them. So from there, we kind of redesigned all of our properties and moved to um, an in-stream and in-feed experience that works really, really well in mobile. And as a result, uh, we developed a native advertising platform as a result. So what is a native ad? Um, a native ad is instead of you know, giving us an image, a 300 by 250, some sort of IV standard, advertisers give us a headline, a description, some images, and then we take those, and depending on the presentation, you know, Yahoo Mail looks different than Yahoo Finance, Yahoo Finance looks different than Tumblr. We dynamically render all these objects into a pleasing native advertisement that is much less disruptive to the consumer experience and actually leads to higher engagement for our advertisers. Um, so fast forward four and a half years now to 2018. Um, so now with this combined company, um, like I said before, uh, we are a house of brands. So the familiar ones are Yahoo, Yahoo Finance, Yahoo News, Yahoo Sports. But we also have Tumblr, AOL, TechCrunch and Gadget um, and Autoblog and a lot of others. So from a product development, from a testing and automation perspective, you can kind of start to see the pain that we deal with and the challenges that we face. We have over 50 mobile applications in market and over 100 different desktop as well as mobile websites. And to complicate things a little bit more, once again, we are a native advertising platform. So we have search ads, we have image ads, video ads, app install ads. We actually have probably 15 or 20 different more uh, different ad formats that aren't even shown here that render differently, have different capabilities depending on who the advertiser is and what the application, um, what the application looks like and is doing. Um, so, it, once again, it's a challenge, but a really interesting experience that we are launching on a daily, on a weekly basis. Um, and if you look at some of our competitors, they actually, I think, have a really easy job. Twitter has a single app. Facebook really just has Facebook and Instagram. So, for them, you know, doing a deployment is easy. For us, we're literally launching and constantly testing and iterating every single day. And in the ads world, it's really, really important to get things right. Um, like I said, we touch over a billion people a month. Um, we're serving over two billion uh, ad impressions every single day. So if we have any issue for any amount of time, we have immediate revenue loss, and more importantly, very upset advertisers and users. So we, we do our best to try to get things right. So to talk a little bit more about how we've conquered this challenge, I'd like to invite Jenny Hung, who is our EDE test lead. Thank you, Kai. So thank you for giving the overview and giving us this challenge. Um, in the next few minutes, we'll cover the technical solution that we built, uh, specifically the end-to-end -end automation test 
that we um, have we have embarked along uh, this past uh, four years uh, with Gemini. So we are here to share some of the insights from our journey and hope that what we learn, um, what we share here will be useful to you when you design and build uh, your end-to-end -end test. We'll also cover some of the, um, our next steps, some of the progress that we are making along. And um, I want to also point out that uh, by no means we are 100% perfect. So it's a, a continuous um, progression, improvements that we are making along um, as the company grows. I like to also point, I like to first point out that what's very unique about end-to-end -end tests is that we run our test on production. Our senior architect and our engineering uh, managers made this conscious and deliberate decision four years ago to have end-to-end -end tests run on production to also serve as a purpose of be our Gemini's um, overall health monitor system. So we can answer the question of what's working and what's not working when there's a revenue change. Our goal is to build a set of reliable and scalable end-to-end -end tests that are also maintainable. Now with the, I would say, a a very good number of combinations of tests that, like Kai mentioned, across different mobile apps, across different websites, across platforms, across device, across OS versions, across um, app formats. How can we keep our E2E test maintainable in addition to making it reliable, as you are aware that um, in a long running end to end test, and in our case, our test takes six to seven hours to complete a full cycle. How can we sort out or prioritize our time to look at the bugs that have the higher priority compared to um, this? I'm sure that in your system, you probably experience um, flakiness or from time to time, random flakiness that may not be reproducible um, when you actually test it manually. Our, well, our goal is to also make sure our test can scale, can scale to run as many times in a day without stepping on each other. So that is the, the, the challenge we have and um, I will share how far along we have progressed along, um, and also some of the design constraints um, and some design decision we put in place when we build our test. So our test covers four layers. The presentation layer, so that means the UI aspect, the UI uh, elements, um, the business layer, so the different rules and logics are the ads, are the right ads serving to the right user at the right time. The data layer, are all the data events, the impressions and the clicks, and what we also call a follow through, a conversion, are those all captured, processed, and reported correctly to our advertiser. Nothing more and nothing less. And lastly, the integration layer. So the web services and API that we support, are those APIs and web services working across the Gemini platform? So advertisers, they interact with us through UI, API, and also um, batch command uploads. In our end-to-end -end test, we have multiple jobs. Currently, we break our job a test into the set of five jobs, starting from creating campaign ads. This set of tests is testing our web services, 
test, making API calls to create test ads into a production system. The first step here usually involves deleting the previous test asset and then recreating a new one. After this job is completed, we verify whether this ad is serving correctly. Does it have all the right content when this ad serves? That's testing the business layer. And so forth, all the way down to reporting. In between, there's the UI automation piece. We start by using Jenkins as our job scheduler. And we also use Jenkins to control the wait time between different jobs. As the number of tests grow, we found that our test here, when it grows to 200, 300 tests, are becoming quite hard to maintain. And also as our system improves, the SOA between various jobs, between various components, improves from time to time. And sometimes we notice, hey, it used to take 45 minutes for an ad to serve, and I don't know, it, the test has been failing. And then we kind of experiment and found that, hmm, now it's taking 60 minutes. Right, so if we have to go and update the Jenkins, sleep time or the wait time in between each job multiplied by 200, 300 jobs, it's um, not the type of work that my team member really like to do. So um, we made progress in this area um, started this year by moving those um, coordination into the test itself. Because in the past, for someone to troubleshoot a test when it fails, they have to look at the code, they look at the test plan, they look at the Jenkins setting, um, and it, it's possible that the test fail because even though we updated this set of wait time um, for this test, but this, test was, this other test was missed. So how can we have a global configuration that can be shared between the test so a change we made is to um, add custom Java annotation to our test in support of delay trigger. We now use a combination of Jenkins and our delay trigger to kick off scheduled, jo scheduled jobs. And then for each test trigger to then be responsible for waiting up to a certain amount of time that is from a global setting, or to allow for customization at the specific trigger level while we are troubleshooting or developing a test. So in this example here, job one is scheduled to run once a day at 12 hour UTC. Now, job one in the actual code itself, we have support for annotation, this test trigger that indicates to wait, to delay uh, wait for um, up to this add serve delay, which is a configuration we control in our base config before executing job two. And in this example, job two, knows that it has a list of triggers. So as soon as the ad can serve, we want them to trigger the next set of jobs. And the next set of jobs is to verify this ad serving, whether it's showing up correctly and working correctly across our desktop, our mobile app, and our mobile web properties. And lastly, not the least, the last trigger we have for job two is then to check, to trigger the check for data. And that once again is a global setting that we support. So now if our system improves or we are observing a longer delay in between different components, we can just update one place instead of having to update all, all across Jenkins. 
Another change that we made recently is um, something we should have done long ago, uh, which is to connect our logging system to Splunk. So we can query in the logging system, not just for troubleshooting purpose, but also for alerting setting based on threshold. Previously, when we ran our test on Jenkins, we have an ability to set alert when the test fail, whenever the test is not stable, then we set alert saying sending out the email to so and so. What we found is because of the nature of end-to-end -end test, there is always a factor of flakiness in the system. We, when we send out the alert emails, so often, um, people ignore them. And I don't blame them because if I have been getting a lot of alert emails, I'll, I'll, I won't be looking at it the second day. So this approach we take using Splunk to um, set alert only if we observe this type of error, for example, more than four times in the past three hours or in the past 24 hours. So we now have a, a way to um, kind of send out more meaningful alerts after we, uh, a step we also need to do is to work with every component owner to get their buy-in, right? So if the test fails once or more times, up to how many times will the engineer, we, engineer teams um, be concerned, and we are concerned as well, so that the engineer team will be um, um, kind of stand by to answer and troubleshoot those failures. So before we can really build end-to-end -end test, um, what we did was we worked with every component to make sure they support end-to-end -end testability. What that means is we uh, make sure every component agree to how a test request should be handled. We built, um, so like I mentioned earlier, we run our testing on production. We create test add into the system to work exactly the same way as real ad. We then run our test to verify new features. New features are pushed onto production in disabled mode. It's not going to turn on. The agreement is product managers don't turn on new feature until the end-to-end -end test pass. So the end-to-end -end test event we need to make sure that can be clearly identified across every component and then in this test event, it needs to have ability to turn on, so passing additional flag in this request to turn on a specific feature to test. Our test ads also need to be protected from being served out to actually production users. So that is another testability protection we have in place because a lot of component owners will be concerned if we are running this test on production, how can we prevent errors from happening? So we prevent test ads from serving on production. So we prevent test ads from leaking out to production users as well as we ensure the test revenue that were, that as a result of our testing does not get billed to this test advertiser and also don't get counted into our overall revenue. For running our end-to-end -end test, we need to have an end-to-end -end test ID. And in our case, for desktop test, we use a cookie as a way to trace a request all the way through the system. For mobile requests, we use the mobile ID, and on, that means on iOS, that's IDFA, and on Android, that's Android Advertising ID. So the combination of 
the add ID, the user ID, which is the end-to-end -end test ID, as well as the timestamp, this set of metadata we write into a shared test data store. Every job when it runs, it reads and writes from this shared test meta store. We add logic into the test framework itself so that it knows to pull that data and also know how much data it can use in making its current checks. One of the design principle that we, um, we know since day one is we need to keep the test simple, hide the logics of dealing with the actual Selenium or the Apnean elements uh, in the test framework layer itself. So when we work with test engineers to write a test, the idea is the test can be written once and be able to run across to scale up quickly. So the, config, the configuration file that our test reads from is, is, a, is a, a list of the environment, um, the capabilities. So we basically create a wrapper on top of the Selenium Appian uh, capabilities and add our additional capabilities. So what you see in one of the configuration is this add unit. So we want to run this test on Android, on Source Lab, as well as in our Yahoo device lab, testing against a specific app. But an app can have multiple pages, and each page can have multiple I units. So we have additional layer of mapping in our test framework to map an I unit to a location on the page in the app. So we also need to make our test reliable. I think you probably are familiar with some of the, the, the issues on this page that, our, um, that we experience uh, different kinds of uh, flakiness or failures. Um, I don't want to say we have solved all of them. I think we are, I want to say it's still working in progress. But um, what we learned um, that I'd like to share with you is um, when dealing with UI automation, the um, layout type of issues, we have to add um, checks before and after. So I, I know there was a previous session about um, web driver that wait. In this specific case, this is supposedly a video that's missing. Even if we waited, the video is not going to show up. And in this type of error, we actually have to, um, we actually cannot reproduce on a real device. And then we have to then take one step further and troubleshoot. And then we eventually found out, oh, on, on simulators, emulators, um, that this type of video player on, that we support on this page um, is not yet supported. So then we work with uh, Source Lab in getting those um, simulator be updated with this type of video player support. Uh, as for the second type of error that we overcome uh, is the random pop-ups. It's not something we can predict when this pop-up will happen, and that makes our test flaky as well. So for this type of error, we went back to the development team and asked them for giving us a debug build for that debug build to um, bypass all pop-ups. And now the question is, if we are supposedly testing on production, and now we have this debug build, how can we make sure the debug build is the same as a production level um, app? So that is something we have to then work with the build person to ensure whenever there is a new build generated, the debug build needs to branch from that same code base. 
Um, now delays. Delays is something we try to um, be allow um, for adjusting in our test uh, framework earlier, but also we still experience that our test will fail because of delay from time to time. It's easy to say that if it's not happening so very often to let it be and just retry. Um, what we try to improve in our test um, is to add uh, the support to actually build into the test this concept of uh, uh, fluid weight. So instead of, instead of waiting for a fixed amount of time before checking downstream, then um, when the check happens, we want there to be minimum wait time, and then the check will go into a retry up to a maximum wait time. And that's what um, currently we are uh, making progress for in our test. Um, next up is how then he will uh, walk through some of our code snippets, as well as um, showing you the demo that we have uh, with our UI automation test on desktop, as well as on Android. Hey guys, um, so, so we are running our automation tests on, uh, with the Selenium for uh, desktop and, the, uh, and IPM for mobile. And then we are running against uh, Sauce Labs and the Yahoo Device Lab, which is a uh, Yahoo private uh, cloud provide a real device um, uh, testing uh, te uh, clusters. So we are running our tests against both emulators and uh, simulators and uh, real devices since uh, we know that the emulator and simulator ha uh, simulators has their advantage of uh, scaling. So it's much easier to run in parallel, much easier to um, just start up a test uh, session without worrying about the device, whether it's in use or we don't have to have a queue of waiting. But as Jenny stated, we, we encounter some issue with the, this, uh, either the emulator or similar. They, may, they might have the connection issues, they might have the supporting issues, or uh, such and such, so many. So we, we run our subset of our tests on real devices to, to just to make sure that those are running properly in the real end, uh, like real end users' uh, mobile devices, and then so I'm gonna focus on uh, the automation, how we actually run the automation, and I show you guys a uh, demo and the code snippet. Uh, for us, basically, either on uh, Sauce Lab or Yahoo Device Lab, it's, uh, or either on uh, desktop and mobile, it's similar, it's quite, quite similar. First of all, we just uh, request for a driver. It could be a Selenium or an IPM driver, and then with the driver, we can grab the ID, the uh, user identifier that Jenny mentioned before, like uh, uh, the cookie from browser or the uh, Google Advertising ID or uh, IDFA for Apple. Uh, with the ID, we have such uh, ability of uh, whitelisting that device or the instance of the device to show given test ad, like to that particular device because for automation purpose, we are mostly focusing, focusing on, the, on the UI, whether it's showing correctly, whether the, uh, the data, the signals are triggering correctly. So uh, we, are not, we are not trying to test the ranking of those. So we do the uh, whitelisting, which actually uh, speed up the whole, test, uh, the whole test period of time. And then after showing the ad, we've, we actually validate the ad serving correctly or not, including the title, description, and uh, the click out page. Um, sometimes video images and different uh, ad format has different um, things to validate. And then after that, we retrieve the logs, the recordings with the session ID provided by the driver. And then like from Sauce Labs, we have the, that page that you can generate from the, with the session ID so that you can access to all the Selenium logs, IPM logs, and screenshots, all those, which is uh, really helpful uh, during troubleshooting and, um, and debugging. And then, so here, it's a more detailed uh, 
flow of how we run our desktop tests, it's you can see like in the in the actually in the blue in the blue boxes is how we actually run the tests, and then you will have a better idea when when I showing you the demo. So first of all, we basically log in and visit visit Yahoo Yahoo pages like finance or whichever Yahoo pages, different pages. We have tons of tens of pages, and then we grab the user identifier, which is a cookie, and then we do the uh, whitelisting. After that, we basically simulate the user's behavior, like uh, visit the website again, since um, we just do down the whitelisting, so the request has to be re sent again, and then we locate the ad, validate the content and landing page, all those. After that, we generate the report, as I stated, and then during the whole process, we are, we are actually storing a lot of metadata, like different IDs and uh, uh, timestamps into a, a shared uh, test data store so that we will be able to validate the downstream, see whether the, uh, whether the data or the signal triggered correctly, the data was crack, uh, collected correctly in our system. So that's uh, critical. So now I'm going to show you the demo. Let me show you this page. So in here, oh, it's loading. You, which is faster? Okay, this one's faster. So we are running our. This is a, actually a recording from Sauce Labs. We got uh, for our desktop automation. First of all, it's going to Yahoo.com, and then currently it's uh, grabbing the the cookie and then do the vet listing. After a few seconds, it's gonna refresh, which basically means the vet listing is down. We are refreshing to, to show the test ad. And then you can see the page moving up and down a little bit just to find out the test ad. So you can see that Tumblr one right there. Tumblr finally something to check out, something fun to check out. It's actually one of our test ads. And then we validated the uh, we validated the title description. There's a sponsored tag and the, even the image. And then after a few seconds, let me just click to that point here. The test will click the ad through to one of our test landing pages. And then on the test landing page, we, have to, we want to make sure that it's going to the correct landing page. So that means... Uh, the, the, uh, the whole ad is running correctly on the page, right? And then that's, that's basically, this is a fundamental case for uh, our desktop automation. So we have much more complicated ones. If you are interested, you can uh, stay after and then I can show you. So, so much for the desktop. Then for mobile, actually mobile automation shares a quite similar process in whole, but the most, uh, most different part would be uh, grabbing the, the advertising ID part. Uh, this page basically tells you how Appium works and then we are actually using Appium. Then in the demo, you will have a really good idea of what is actually going on with our um, Android automation. So we are running, this is a recording from Sauce Labs again. And then it's a emulator, you can see, Android test. So this is really long, it's eight minutes and more. We don't have that much time, so I'm gonna jump to critical points I find. So like here it's still loading emulator, one of the drawbacks. So here, faster. Okay, we can, we can, see, we can see that Android page, homepage, and then see this, uh, this app loaded. It's actually Yahoo Mail, and this is the welcome page of Yahoo Mail. And then they, actually, the following process is logging in. It takes minutes, one minute and more. We just we try to make it uh, reliable, so we we wait and get, until we are sure that it's going correctly. And then for this, after logging in, you can see this page. This page is actually the Yahoo Mail page. And then on the top, the Turbo Box one, a uh, Turbo Text one, sorry, <laughs> it's the uh, it's uh, the Gemini ad. And then what we did. This is critical, like for Android, this, only, uh, this is the only valid approach for Android. If for iOS, we have another approach. If you are interested in, you can talk to us after this session. So we are actually going to, uh, we are actually going to the setting page. And then at setting page, 
you can see uh, advertising ID. We are actually res resetting it because for emulators, every emulator when it starts, it's the same advertising ID, and then after reset, you will got you will get a fresh one so that we can do the wet listing in our at our backend. Then with this fresh ID, we do backlist uh, wet listing in the backend, and then jump to this page. So after reload of the uh, Yahoo, Yahoo Mail app, you can see a test ad up there, which is a Gemini ad, it's a test ad, and then after we validate the uh, title description of the ad, we actually click the watch, there's a little button on the right corner, and then click watch, it's a video ad, you can see the split screen behavior of, the, of this ad, ad, advertisement, and then the, as the video playing, the uh, the lower part loading is one of our test landing pages. So you can actually uh, browse the test landing page and as well as uh, watching the video. And then after this, what makes video ad more complicated, you have to wait until this page and then click replay. Then say the video, is, the video length is around 30 seconds, you have to wait another 30 seconds. So, and then after the replay, basically, the test actually clicks learn more, which leads to, oh, I don't want to click this up, okay. Which leads to a fully loaded, like, full screen landing page. So, this is, this, these, these two demos I'm giving, it's, um, it's like our everyday test running. And, and then after the test running, we basically use these reports generated by mostly Sauce Labs, and then for the tests we are not running against Sauce Labs, we uh, use TestNG to generate our own reports, and then since it's uh, also IPM, it's uh, re provide recording and all those similar functionality. And then here is the, the code snippet. Um, as Jenny sta uh, stated up there, it's uh, the uh, delayed downstream triggering, and then after that, we are loading the configurations Jenny showed you guys. Uh, which, which contains different uh, configurations. So this whole piece of uh, code can run on different um, Android mobile apps. That's what we designed initially, that, and that's what we are going towards to, to make it easier to scale. And then you can see this is the exact code snippet for the video I showed you, like the Android uh, automation demo, which is fairly complicated, but the, the test, the, the code itself is not so complicated. We encapsulate uh, much functions um, into our framework so that the test can run um, in a sh so short uh, pair, pair, uh, piece of uh, code snippet. Then um, in the bubbles, you can, you can actually read these, uh, uh, basically what I just told you guys, the flows we are running. And then down there at the end, you can see we are saving all the metadata into our shared uh, data store. Then after that, it, it's the most critical part. <laughs> then I would say that's all. Thank you, guys. <laughs>